well. We certainly are glad to be back in church tonight. And um, I'm sitting down here thinking what would be the best thing to uh, what would be the best topic to get on? And the only thing I can think of is um, there's so many things you can talk about. But I'm looking at the scripture here in Roman in First Corinthians chapter 12. And if I stop to cough a little, don't be don't be surprised because I had a sore throat from Monday. Um, trying to treat it the best as I can. <clears throat> Maybe it's one method to help me not to scream. But um, God is in control of everything. And every circumstance that comes our path, whether positive or negative, is something that he has ordained for us. And the scripture tells us, David said, the very... Our days, the scripture tells us that our days are numbered. And I think it's in Psalms 139, David says that our path is charted out ahead of us. He knew us before we were born. And this is all so beautiful. And we're here in what we classify as a church. Now, we have heard over and over again that the church is not a building, per se, but it's the group of individuals that make up that group. Whether we own the building or we are under a tree, the church is made up of the people, uh, the ones who are called out from the world. And uh, Paul, uh, he has this beautiful statement he made in Galatians, the first chapter. I'm coming back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, but in Galatians, the very first chapter, and we'll be going a little bit, if the Lord helps us here, into some of these scriptures tonight. And in Galatians chapter 1, after he introduces the, the chapter, he says, Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man. And that is something that we need to understand. An apostle is never self-made. An apostle is not voted into office. An apostle is one ordained by God. A man sent out by God. Today, in our world, everyone wants to be an apostle. Now, a man might do the work of an apostle, but that does not make him qualify as a true apostle. A person might go out and start churches and plant churches, and that's the work of an apostle. Like a person might go out and evangelize, and that's the work of an evangelist. But if God has not called that man to do that and sent him out, he might be more destructive uh, doing something that he is not called to do than someone that's filling in the office because God has called him to do that. And so Paul in writing here, he says, I'm an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. And he says, And all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia. And he says, Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. It's so beautiful to understand that all over uh, the word of God you find that it's a trinity is never promoted. And a oneness doctrine is never promoted, but they are two separate entities in the Godhead. In Brother Joe's um, um, blog, in his a little website, he identifies the, the beauty of the Godhead. And one of the things he does in that blog, he shows that if you check all the introductions uh, to the epistles, it's always grace be unto you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus. There's more to, to establish two in the Godhead, two separate and distinct entities in the Godhead, than there is to promote a trinity or a oneness. And then he comes down here in verse 4, and that's the verse I want you to look at. He says, who give himself, Jesus give himself 
for our sins. And this is, <clears throat> this is, you could not have had greater love than this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You know, we read that, it becomes such a common statement. But if you had to give your son as a sacrifice, people cry when their sons have to go into the army. If you had to sacrifice your son, don't tell me it's an easy thing to do. It's not easy. Uh, and so he said, who give himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age, according to the will of God and our Father. Now, the will of God, the will of God is not just to have us gathered together as a group and meet in the church, um, just to have a jolly good time. The purpose of the church is to present us with a message that will save us from this present evil world. When Paul was writing this in 80, approximately 80, 50, uh, he had a present evil world that existed at that time. We today, in the year 2018, we have a different evil world that's existing today. We have more to understand and to learn about this present evil world that is with all subtlety existing in order to save ourselves from it. And it's important for ministers not to study how many toes the beast has or how many heads he's got. All of that is good. It has its place. But if you don't know anything like that and all you are able to learn is to understand how evil this present world is and to identify evil in this present world and seek God's help to overcome the evil, that's all you need. You don't need a head full of knowledge to analyze. God should never be put under man's scrutiny. He is the creator. It's like your computer wanting to study you. It can't happen. Uh, the design can never understand the designer. No matter how it tries. The creation can never understand the creator. No matter how hard it tries. The finite mind can never comprehend infinity. And when we reach the maximum of our knowledge and understanding, the Apostle Paul says we see through a glass darkly. It takes a resurrection that changed this mortal to immortality that will give us the mind capable of comprehending God to a certain extent. Even then, I'm not sure how much we can comprehend him. But when we see Jesus and we become like him and this mortal puts on immortality and the finite becomes infinite, you understand? It'll be easy to understand. But God sent his son to die that he might save us from this present evil world. Now here we are in the 21st century in a congregation sitting here and Ask, we want to ask ourselves the question, do we understand evil as it exists? You know, the word evil is a generally word. But do we understand evil as it exists in the sports world? Do we understand evil as it exists in the entertainment world? Do we understand evil as it exists all around us? Because what we need to understand is understand the evil around us because we have so much evil already in us that would be further ruined by the evil outside of us. See, the world by itself wouldn't have no hold on us if we were already sinless. If we were pure without a fallen nature, we don't need to bother with the world. It would. Satan went to Jesus and had found nothing in him. He was sinless. He didn't have a fallen nature. But you and I are susceptible to evil. And so the world, designed by the God of this world, who is the devil, has so many distractions 
that if we don't know the loopholes, you know when you are a soldier in war and you're going into especially desert warfare and you're walking into a desert warfare and no enemy is expecting you, what they do, they have hidden mines, bombs, they have bombs, bombs, wrong little circular bombs, they set under the sand and they make sure that the wind blows over it. So when you step on that, it will trigger an explosion, blow your leg off or kill you instantly. And so when you're going on this, on this dangerous pathway to get into a certain area, you have to have mind detectors. Without your mind detectors, you don't stand a fighting chance against the bombs and the traps that they have to ensnare you. And that is how it is in the spiritual warfare. If you're not sensitive to evil and you can't recognize evil as it exists, you might be even engaged in evil and don't know it's evil. Today I had a talk with a lady, the, uh, the people that comes, that comes once a year to clean my eaves trough. And she's a very nice lady. She calls and she, she remembers our conversation from last year. And she said, Pastor, how are you doing? I said, I'm fine. I'm sitting in my car. She said, I caught you a bad time. I said, no, you caught me the perfect time because I just pulled in my parking lot. And we talked about the world. and We talked about things in this world. And she was all ears, never in a rush, all ears. And I told her, I said, you know, so many things are contrary in this world. She was telling me of her, her dad dying at an early age and how he was a very particular man. He didn't want him to spend anything for the funeral. He didn't want people to pass by his casket and say, saw him on display, dead. I said, I like that man already. Never met him, but I love him. And I told her, I said, isn't it strange that in this world, you know, you try to get the gospel out to everyone. I said, isn't it strange in this world that when somebody has a graduation, you give them a bunch of flowers? They graduate. You don't see people carry flowers to graduation ceremonies. I said, when people uh, perform something or does, uh, as a wife's birthday, husband comes home with flowers. I said, that's wonderful. Then why are you giving flowers to the dead? She said, you know, I never thought of that. I said, have you ever, re are, are you glad that I'm dead? And so you're bringing flowers and I can't even see the flowers? She said, you know, why do we do that? I said, because the origin of it is worship of the dead. Worship of the dead, that's where flowers for the dead has its origin. And today, commercial world has taken that and brought it into spending thousands of dollars that goes to waste and make the flower company rich, richer because you worship the dead. But we're not worshiping the dead. We do things innocently. Well, won't it be good now that you know? You don't go spend hundreds of dollars on flowers. Send a gift card to the family with a sympathy. When you send all these flower arrangements, who is looking at it? Won't you go there to see if your flower stands up good in comparison to the others? It's all for personal glory. And a simple lesson like that is, for, is important for us to examine every aspect of this world, what we do in this world. But you know, Mankind say, well, I'm going to still send my flowers to the dead. Well, let the dead send flowers to the dead. No problem with that. I don't have a problem with that. You understand what I mean? But when I start to see things coming out to life, I'm starting to recognize evil. I'm starting to see things having an evil origin. I would not want to do anything that the devil started. No matter how customary you are doing it. And as we draw closer to God and we are being sanctified, we will learn how we can give up. And that is why Jesus died. He died to save us 
from the entanglements and the bondage that this world have us in. And Paul is getting into that in Galatians when he goes on further on to show that these saints and these churches that he started in Galatia got into rituals. Right? Uh, hold your finger there. Uh, leave chapter 1, come over to chapter 3 in Galatians. He says, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? Isn't that a strong word for an apostle to use to Christians? Who hath bewitched? Bewitched you. Do you know when you turn to chapter 5 in Galatians and it says here in verse 20, among the works of the flesh in Galatians 5, do you see the second word in verse 20? What is that? Witchcraft. Mm -hmm. Is that a work of the flesh? Yes, it is. Witchcraft, it, it's dealing with demonic powers because the devil works with our flesh. <clears throat> the devil capitalizes on our carnal nature. And so the world outside of us, around us, was created to play on your fallen nature. The dirty movie. The football game. The concert and the flamboyant things they have in the world is designed to pull you, play on your lust. You see, and that is why when John wrote, he says, he says, the world passeth away and the lust thereof, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. These all will pass away. You mean that has to do with the world? Yes. The world is interwoven with your fallen nature. And that is why the church is designed to save you from the world by saving you from your fallen nature. When your fallen nature can conquer that, the world and the lust thereof, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, these all pass away. But he that doeth the will of God abided forever. So the world out here has a lot of things that you can be naive of. So we talked about that. See, I'm talking to the lady sending people to clean my gutter. And I feel it's the time to preach the gospel. I preach to her the gospel. Right? And, and, and that's how it should be. And so Paul is saying, who had bewitched you? Uh, in chapter 5, in chapter 3, he says, O foolish Galatians, who have bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, be, uh, before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth, crucified among you. He says, who had bewitched you? And that is important to understand. Well, what was bewitching them? Uh, someone was twisting the gospel. So back in chapter 1 of Galatians, he says here, he says, um, in chapter 1, Jesus gave himself that he might deliver us from this present evil world. And then he said here in, uh, in verse 6, he says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ. Now, who was that him that called you into the grace of Christ? Paul was. And people had moved away from Paul's teachings. And that's the sad situation in many churches. Israel lost in the wilderness. They lost out in the wilderness because Moses could not teach them anymore. They felt Moses brought them to suffer. Miriam and Aaron approached him and says, You think God speaks by you only? He uses us too. God judged him because God, Moses was man, God's man. And Paul was the one that planted these churches and they should never have departed from his teachings. Amen. And so he says, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that call you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there are some that, are, that trouble you and would twist, pervert, undermine, Change the interpretation of, pervert the gospel of Christ. When an individual takes the gospel 
and pervert it and twist it and make it accommodating to the evils of this world. Like Christmas is coming on. Jesus was not born on the 25th of December. The dumbest man out there knows that. And yet, we celebrate the birth of Christ on the 25th of December like pagans. We condemn the Catholic Church, but Chris Mass, Mass for Christ, we celebrate. And not only celebrate that, we put up Christmas trees. We kiss under the mistletoe. We do everything contrary. I tell you what, the bride members would not be inv involved in this. Amen. That's why I don't think we have bride members today. These are they that follow the Lamb. You think the Lamb would do that? Serving the Lord is not a breeze. It takes a sacrifice. And that is why I can't force individuals. You got to do it on your own. I got to preach the gospel. And your blood is off my shoulder when I preach the gospel. Your blood is on your own shoulder when you hear it from the pulpit. And you violate it. But God saves his people. His method of saving is not always easy. And as we come into church, we are here as a body and we come on in and we must understand how important the roots of our doctrine and faith is. We cannot leave the foundation that we were planted on. And not, I didn't say tradition. I said foundation that we were planted on. And Paul went on here, he says, which is not another. Uh, he says, um, where am I? Marvel, you're so soon for removed from him that has called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel. But though we, he did not exclude himself. Did Paul have an uncertainty about his position? No, but he said this a lot of times Paul make a statement for the benefit of those reading. He could say you, but he says though we are an angel from heaven. From where? Heaven. Preach any other gospel unto you than that which you have than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. He says, if today an angel comes down, flapping his wings and comes down and says, oh, I'm going to preach a different gospel. Paul says, let him be damned. Mm -hmm. That's right. If an angel comes and appears in my room tonight and says, Jesus did not die for you. I says, get out of my room. You perverted angel. Some people are glad to see an angel. Well, it's not good. Never want to see an angel quickly. Joseph Smith, the starter of the Mormon church, he saw one. William Branham, that taught the doctrine of the, of the serpent seed, he saw one. They got instructed by angels. But aren't you glad Gabriel did not go to Cornelius and instruct him? But he sent custom out Peter. He says, you go and instruct him. You see, that's how God operates. God sends his ministers to do the job, not angels. Angels are there desiring to even look into what we have as salvation. But they have never been blessed with that experience that we have. God uses men. When he ascended on high, he gave gifts unto men. Men with problems. Men that had to overcome situations. And that is why tonight we are here in church. Because this Bible would have been a very slim book. Had it not been for men that had problems. Seems like we're touching that subject ever so often. We did a good job on it on the weekend. How many years we give David in prison? For circumcises. For circumcising 200 Philistines? 1,000 years. Five years, for, five years for each circumcision. He ain't coming out. That's apart from the people he killed. But this book, this book gives us these lives that God took. 
and change them around and make giants and stalwarts out of these weak individuals. Peter did not cost the rest of his life. Peter was soft and that fisherman got converted and changed. And that is why the Lord has us preaching the gospel tonight that he might save us from this present evil world. And so he has brought us into this church and we have a collection of saints. And we are many here, seeing you're in Galatians. Uh, let's, before we go back to Corinthians, let's look at Galatians, the sixth chapter. <clears throat> Paul is writing here. In chapter 5, he names a lot of problems here in the flesh, the fleshly problem. He says um, a, lot of, a lot of areas, the works of the flesh, verse 19 and 20 and 21. And with, tonight we are not dealing with the works of the flesh in detail, but we are just dealing with our human nature. I'm trying to talk to us tonight and show that we here, in order for us to become overcomers, we need the negative circumstances that God will place us in. For me to love my enemies, I need some enemies. For me to show patience, I need someone that would aggravate my patience. As long as I'm impatient, God will give me tribulation to work patience. Tribulation I need for patience. I need to be, uh, the very purpose of salvation, I need to be a sinner for God to save me. And so you need, in order for you to grow in God, you need the negative situations around you so you can stand on the word of God. See, blessed is the man that meditate in his word day and night. No, no, no. Meditating in the word day and night, and if that's all you do, that's not good enough. But blessed is the man that because he meditates day and night, he does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. There is not one single human being I know of that does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. That is why we need more of God in the church. Ungodly does not really mean you're drinking and cussing. Ungodly could be you're unlike what God wants. All right? And so when you think about that, and so Paul is dealing with some of these areas here. <clears throat> he says here, uh, the fruit of the Spirit, he says, verse 22 in chapter 5. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit is, is love. The fruit of the Holy Spirit. If you have the Holy Spirit... The Spirit of the Father and the Spirit of the Son dwelling in you, what you will have. See, an apple tree can bear oranges unless you graft it, but a genuine apple tree will bear apples. The tree would produce, if Christ is the vine and we are the branches and we are grafted onto Christ, what do you think we will be producing? The fruit that come from his spirit. So when you have hatred, when you have the works of the flesh, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, and variance, and all this contrary thing, you don't have, you're not grafted in properly. Maybe the connection was not made. He got a spirit, but it's not his spirit. See, we are here in church to learn to be the more we abide in him and he abides in us but we cannot serve two masters at the same time we cannot pull let the world pull us and let christ pull us at the same somewhere down the line we've got to cut every day cut our connections with the world by if you want to grow in the spirit you have to give away what the flesh wants you have to give it up all right even when you have the Holy Spirit, he does not eliminate your flesh. The Holy Spirit coming in you gives you that strength to overcome. So there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ who walk not after the flesh. You can be in Christ and choose to walk after the flesh. You see, it's a job that we have to be involved in. All right. And so when Paul is going through all of these, he says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. Joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, God. 
goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. You know what is good? Years ago, I told the church, make a chart. Put all the works of the flesh on one side, put all the works of the spirit, spirit, fruit of the spirit on the other side. And then identify each one that you have of the flesh and identify which one you have of the spirit. That is something you need to do. Don't study how many toes the beast has. Study how much flesh you have. And how much of the fruit of the spirit. It will save you better. If that happens. Since the Dorcas gave us a little frivolous experience she had. You think that happened by accident? No. Everything happens because it's a purpose. That man targeted her because... God knows she's a child of God and the devil had to do his job but she had to respond with sweetness. Now I don't know how she responds. She got to figure that out. But it will happen again and it will happen again until when they strike you. There was a wood some missionary told me about. I can't remember the name of the tree. It was, it will come to my mind sooner or later. But there's a mission that told us they have a wood that when you chop it, you try to chop the tree down, when you hit it, it gives you the sweet aroma. Sandalwood, I think it was. Check, must check it out for me sometime. I think it's called sandalwood. He says you chop it, it gives a sweet aroma. And the more you chop, the more you get a sweet aroma coming out. And that's how a Christian ought to be. Someone is trying to strike you. You radiate love. Come on, try again. See, I told you before, we have to come to the place where you only choose to be angry when you want to be angry. You choose to be sad when you want to be sad. You carry a burden all the time, but you must manifest the peace of God to the people around you. See, when I think of all the problems in the world, and I think of all the in, in, uh, insufficiencies that we, we experience in the church, I don't find any reason to go dance in church. I don't have any reason to see what the world is doing and follow it. That's me. Maybe you don't. But the burden and the, the struggles I have and the, and the burdens I bear keeps me more sad than happy. When someone comes and says, you happy now? That's the dumbest question you can ever ask me. I'm pleased sometimes. Happy? Never happy. Because there's always a burden. By the time you smile and laugh at a situation... You remember there are five more situations that you that bothers you every moment of the day. You're thinking of someone's problem. There hasn't been one hour past me today without me thinking of a problem and a burden that makes me, you know, I can't think like Jesus did. And that's why he was a man of sorrows. All the time. He was a man of sorrows. All the time. He was not a giggly Jesus. Like the Hollywood makes him out to be in some movies. All you're seeing is 32 Jesus. And shaking your hand. And you, no. He was a man of sorrows. And acquainted with grief. Sorrow for his family. Sorrow for the sin of the world. Sorrow for false religion as it exists. Sorrow for the lost and dying sinners that he comes to die for. The grief was so much that his death was not even sufficient as far as he was concerned. And so when Paul is saying all of this, it would be good that a child of God write this down. And Paul says in verse 24, that they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections affections and lust when you come to Christ you crucify on a daily basis don't please yourself you know we live in a world every day there's a no gizmo and gadget something they got out there I gotta get it 
I told her since January today, she was telling me about some gadget and tell her, I said, no, nah, that's not for me. You know? All these gizmos, all these gadgets, I'll take the money. You want to buy me a present, give me money. Best of present. Don't buy me a sweater. Don't buy me a shirt. Don't buy me a tie. I got, my see, 36 ties in a drawer. I put them up. I wear the old ones. I don't want tape recorder. I don't want sunglasses. I don't want what the world has. Are you following what I'm saying? And people around that are dying to this world, don't destroy them by giving them a wrong gift. Everybody can use money. Except the baby. A baby can take diapers. A baby can take little baby bonnets. And all of that. But when a somebody is, is matured. Think wisely. Don't spend your money for that which is not bread. Children of God must grow. And so Paul says if we live... Uh, he says, verse 24, They that are Christ have crucified the flesh and the affections and lusts. All of this, we're, we're to be dying daily, not improving in our carnality. This world is, is putting pressure on us. And it goes on, it says, If we live in the Spirit, let us also, if we live in the Spirit, what must we do? Walk in the Spirit. In other words, pray in the morning. Say, oh God, I'm evil. Please help me today. Last thing I told that lady this day, I said, you know what? I told her. I said, I told my daughter this, that I read this some time ago, that you live every day because time is moving so fast. That's what she told me. This year is done. She said to me just a couple of months ago, we did the eavesdrop. I said, well, it's the ending of the year. My will is stop shedding. Time to clean my gutters. She said, time is moving so fast. I said, that is why every day you have to live with it with positive thoughts. I said, I told my daughter that every day is a new page in your diary of life. When you get up in the morning, think about this is a day that this page that I will fill in my diary the diary of my life. I want to fill it with good things. I want to stop and say, say, say hello to someone. How are you doing? Isn't this a beautiful day? I want to see if I can buy someone a coffee. See if I can help someone. See if I can cheer up someone that's burdened with some burden. I want to talk to God. I want to study my Bible. You know, I have this sore throat and every reason to be in bed for about a week. I said, I can't be in bed for a week. So I went and got me medication. Took it. Strong medication so I can conquer the thing. In two days, don't I? I'm, aren't you surprised I'm preaching tonight? Yes. I can't be defeated because of a bug in the atmosphere. I've got ways that I can defeat it. Right? And I told her, I said... When you finish your day and you're ready to go to bed, said today was a good day, I blessed someone. I said some good words to someone. Today's diary, that page is worth the while. And that's why we are here. Because you cannot be an overcomer by yourself. I remember that one time I met a sister sitting out in our car outside. And she always does that. Look at her one Sunday, two Sunday. Young sister sitting outside in her car. So I said, why are you sitting outside? In your car. She said, because she don't want to talk to those gossipers in the church. So she sat outside. She came in when church was about to start. Because all you people in here are a bunch of gossipers. And I could predict that she will backslide. Because you need the gossipers. You need the tail bearers. You need the ones that get angry and tell you off. How can you grow in God if you don't have all the negative elements around you daily? 
And so Paul is, Paul is saying, you can't walk in the spirit if there's no carnal things to encounter. You understand what I'm saying? And so Paul went on, he says, let us not be desirous of vain glory. Humble yourself, my friend. Don't be desirous of something to pump you up and give you glory. Don't boast and brag about your accomplishments in the face of people that are suffering defeat. To the weak, become weak. To the strong, be strong. Be all things to all men that you might win some. Humble yourself under the mighty hands of God. This is why Jesus died, to make me overcome the world. And the world is not some tangible thing out there. It's the world that plays in our flesh and our fallen nature. And that's why it's all about. And so Paul, uh, he says, let us not be desirous of vain glory, but do what? Read it. Provoking one another. Stop there. What are we to do? Provoke. Provoke. But Raleigh, provoke me. But watch, listen to what it says. Provoke one another. Envy. Provoke, provoking one another, envying one another. Isn't that something contrary to what he's talking about? Well, depends on what you're provoking to do. All right, chapter 6, verse 1. So, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual. Well, I'm spiritual, praise the Lord. Yeah, you all look at me here. I'm spiritual. I'm a very spiritual guy. Hmm. You fall, I step on you, crush you down because I don't want sinners in my company. You know where Jesus spent most of his time? You know what they accuse him of? He wasn't per performing sin and accommodating sin, but he came to save the sinners. And you would read another Paul statement. He says, provoke one another to good works. Provoke one another to love. See, that's what we need to do. I'm to provoke you. What do you think I'm doing tonight? I'm here tonight provoking you to love one another. And if a man be overtaken in the fall, you which are spiritual, step on him. Gossip his name. Well, let's say the fault that Brother Terry has is to gossip against Sister Doherty. So when the fault is he's going to, it's easy now, if he gossips Sister Doherty, Brother Joe can forgive him easy. But can Sister Doherty forgive him? You see, when it's personal, it becomes more difficult. If he's, if he's gossip Brother Joe, Sister Doherty, I have no problem, forgive him. But when it becomes personal, it is God targeting you. That's when the challenge is yours. When it becomes personal, when someone goes against your grain, it gives you an opportunity to forgive. That's when you can really forgive. Not when somebody is hurting somebody else. When somebody is hurting you. He says, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, do what? Put him on the discipline. Excommunicate him. Your job is to restore the man less than he was before. What restore means? What restore means? Bring him back to the original condition. That's your job. See, we're not here on a one by one, me and the Lord have a good time. When you and the Lord have a good time and that's all the good time you have, you ain't got no good time. It's not you and the Lord, it's you and yourself. See, the Pharisee that went into the temple to pray, he prayed, the scripture says, with himself. Well, I pray, hallelujah. You know, my mama taught me, and yeah, this is where I was brought up. Well, you can come to the place that you don't really pray sincere prayer. You chant prayers, you say prayers, but you don't pray prayers. When you pray prayers, you pray for people, it brings a grief and a burden for those individuals. Don't just point your finger and condemn. Don't step on them. 
That when you're pulling someone down, it's, be, be, it's because you're below. Mm. You with your spiritual restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. God help us. So that Holy Ghost and all the gifts you have, all the fruit of the Spirit, that's it where it we know. Well, I, I spoke in tongues very loud today. <clears throat> you speaking in tongues in all languages, genuine tongues. I'm not talking about the fake little Sematiya thing that you make up. I'm talking about if you really got the gift of tongues and you fail to have charity, you're a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. The gifts are all the gifts working in you and no fruit is a waste of time. That's what this lesson is about. <clears throat> Paul says, in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest thou also be tempted. Verse 2, bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill. The law of Christ, Brother Raleigh, is for you to bear somebody's burden. I'm glad that between you and Brother John, you come down and rake all the leaves to help Brother Joe. This is a valuable man, right? And he couldn't, should not, he doesn't have to be here with us. He can go with his family. And I look at him. He says, I'll be gone to visit my family. Pastor, I'll see you back on Wednesday. He's leaving Sunday afternoon after church. Right? When church is done, he leaves after church. He says, I'm going to leave after church. See you back on Wednesday. Monday night, he's calling me. Yeah. I'm here. You know what? That is such a common thing because I can scarcely leave church. You know, it kills me to make a trip into India. And I'm trying to tell these people, I'm not going to do this for long. I'm, for the sake of their soul, I'm going to do it. But I want to quit because that's not my calling to travel around the world. The greatest apostle made three trips. All I have to do is give you the word. I don't want to be entertained. I don't want to be treated nice. I just want to give you the word. That's what my responsibility is. What you do with the word is important. I know people love me and they like to honor me. All of that is good, but I would prefer God to honor me. And so Paul went on, he says, bury one another's and so fulfill. Find out why that person is sad. Find out why they have a problem. Find out why they're not in church, why they miss service. Don't just live your independent life. We are our brother's keepers. And he goes on here, he says, If a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. And then he goes on further on. And then he says in verse 8, he says, For he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. When you give somebody something, don't tell the world about it either. Be nice. Make sure you're not giving it for your own pleasure. But I did good today, Lord, you know. No. Do it out of a charity, heart of charity and for the need that is covered. Time is running out on me. So he says here, uh, verse uh, 8 and 9, uh, For he that sow it to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that sow it to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Let us not, everybody, verse 9 together, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we don't give up. Well, I'm doing good today. Nobody's telling me thank you. Doing good tomorrow. Nobody's telling you. You got to be in my shoe. I do good for 50 years. And most of the people that I did good to has fled. But it has helped me. It has helped me to understand how Jesus felt when he died and the world didn't get saved. The power of his death 
was powerful enough to save the whole world. But they crucified him. He came to his own. They killed him. His own brothers had a problem with him. His family had a problem with him. But he did his work. And I love him as a savior. He is the best savior you can ever find. And that's why it's so wonderful to read these things. Let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season. And then he goes on verse 10. As we therefore have opportunity. Let us do good. Unto the saints in church only. Unto all men. Find somebody in the street look like they're hungry. And you got your last two dollars. You were going to go buy coffee. Buy it for that person. And don't tell them, you give them your address to come back and, and help you mow your lawn. No. Be good. You know how many times you, you can, you're encountering angels and don't even know? That's why you can't afford not to be nice to the people. You can't afford to have enemies. You can't afford to hate people. You know, ever so often I meet a disgusting person. There's a young man I see and he's disgusting. You know what I'm talking about. I tell China, this boy is so disgusting. And I didn't tell her one day I left home. Because something was telling me that I'll see him. So I walked over there by McDonald's and he's in front of Dollarama standing in front there. The disgusting man. So I went in the store. He says, hmm, when I say hi. Right? And I went in, come back out. I looked at him. I said, you hungry? His eyes bright up. This was this week. His eyes bright up. He said, yes. Went into McDonald's. And I bought him. And the lady says, what are you having? I said, nothing. Because I just dealing with my own spirit. See, that was dealing with my own spirit because as far as I was concerned, he's disgusting. Not anymore. You, you, change the, you change the pattern of life by your response to things. And that is so good because God can help us. So when you find there is a saint in church that don't like you, love them. Well, they don't want to be loved. Well, love them from far. Pray for them. Make a hit list. Make a hit list of all the people you hate and don't like and then just scratch, scratch out hit and put prayer. And every day you pray for that person you don't like for one month. That'll do two things in your life. One, it'll get you to pray every day. And two, it'll help you to love the unlovable. Two things it'll do for you. Change your spirit. And so Paul went on, as he says, we have opportunity, let us do good to all men, especially unto them who are in church and are in the part of the assembly. And those that are in the assembly, you have to love. You have to love the saints of God, the family in church, more than the family out of church. And so here in 1 Corinthians 12 and we want to bring it all up here and see how best we can close off this lesson before time runs out on us. Paul writes here and he talks about all these gifts of the Spirit in chapter 12, the first part. He talks about all the gifts of Spirit, the gifts of healing and, and uh, the same Lord. But you remember Corinth had a division problem and all these lessons Paul is preaching to these people is to preach unity. To show that God's united. The spirit is one spirit. He says here in chapter 12 and verse 4. Now there are diversities of gifts. But the same spirit. There are differences of administration. But the same Lord. He says and there are diversities of operation. But it is the same God. Which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the spirit. Is given to every man to profit with all. He says, for to one is given the spirit of wisdom, and he names all of these gifts all the way down. And then in verse 11, after naming all the gifts, he said in verse 11, all these work it, the one and self-same spirit, one spirit. 
And you know, that is a strange thing because I, if I have the Holy Ghost and you have the Holy Ghost, how come our doctrines are different? It's either both of us ain't got it or one of us has it. Because I believe if we have the same Holy Ghost, we will not be diverse in our judgment. So there is a missing element in the work of God. And it says here, uh, verse 12, For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of one body, being many, are all one, so also in Christ. For by one, one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Whereby, whether, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, we have all been made to drink of one spirit. See the, the concept of oneness? A church should not be divided. A church should not have factions. A fellowship should not be divided. Should not have factions. But when people are teaching contrary, it means that we are losing the direction of the one spirit. All right? And he goes on, he says, For the body is not, not one member, but many. Can the foot say, it's Because I'm not the hand, I'm not of the body. And he goes down with a similar thought pattern right down, all the way down to say that every member needs the other member. Now, I want to be like Brother Raleigh. No, no, no. I should be like myself. Find out what God wants me to be and accept Brother Raleigh for what he is. Brother John can be Brother Sam, and Brother Sam can be Brother Terry. We are all different. Everyone has a different approach. And we have to come to the place as members in this body of accepting the difference of function in each one and see all are heading in the same direction and are to accomplish the same results. Right? Because when it all boils down as a body, we are faced with one world out there that wants to destroy us. But when we start to help each other and care for each other and consider each other together as we unite together and develop a holy environment and a, con a church that's a controlled environment. You know when a baby is born, before a baby is born, that little fetus, he can't just take it out and put it in a bowl and let it grow. No, that fetus needs a controlled environment. It needs a womb. And mama can be drinking beer and smoking and expect a healthy fetus to develop. Mama has to bring herself into submission to the principles that are governing the development of that child. Well, the church must be a controlled environment as the womb is a controlled environment. Amen. And what that church feeds on is important in developing the man-child that Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus is coming back to, to resurrect and to be with him. For us to be overcomers, we need a controlled environment. We can't just have a slop bucket and call it a church. We can't just let everyone function and do what they want. It can't be footloose and fancy free. It must be a controlled environment. And that is such a hard thing to accomplish because everyone wants to live their independent lives and we can't build a church. So may God help us to build a church. Amen. Not a church that gets happy when we meet together and dance. And shout. One that when we move out of here, we're still united. We're here together, but when you go to your end of the, uh, of the city and I go to my corner of the city, we're still united in spirit. We communicate in prayer. We're bonded together. And he goes on here. He says much more. He comes down a whole long lesson. I don't have time to get with all of this. But he says, uh, verse coming down in chapter 12 and verse 23, it says, <clears throat> oh, let me see here. And those members of the body which seem to be less honorable, verse 23, 
and those members of the body which seem to be less honorable. When you look around, if I'm missing from church, some people you wouldn't want to go up and preach because, you know, they're not preachers. Right? Wouldn't that be something if I leave the church?